My speech, of course, is based on the unity of the Church, which is really the mission that Christ has given me in the calling that has started in 1985. So, since then, which was very difficult in the beginning to accept what was happening to me, I said yes to the Lord, because when He spoke, I believed. And so this is the result of this more than 20 years of struggle because it is a struggle it's a very difficult task beyond my capacity and so because it is of course beyond my capacity it's God who leads this is his all what's here has been organized by the Most High and so I'm just to transmit these messages and call out to the people around the world as God said do not make any distinction between Christians and between my creatures furthermore than Christians to all people it is a cry from above for reconciliation, peace, and unity. The Church, we know, is one, and has always been one. But the people of the Church are those that with their quarrels, prejudices, their pride, and mainly their lack of love, for one another manage to divide themselves and we all know it Christ is offended and he said in a message my kingdom on earth is my church and the Eucharist is the life of my church this church I myself have given you I have left you with one church but hardly had I left, just barely had I turned back to go to the Father, then you reduced my house to a desolation. You levered it to the ground. And my flock is straying left and right. For how long am I to drink the cup of your division, cup of affliction and devastation. For this lament of Christ coming from Christ, the search for reconciliation and unity must pervade the whole life of the Church and become our priority so as to reach this goal that is Christ's goal. It is our due to God. It is our obligation to God. And it is our responsibility for safeguarding the credibility of the Church. However, no matter how much the Church struggles to attain this goal, so long as the Feast of Easter is not unified and not celebrated together, our division will remain. And there will be no progress because Christ has been asking them for years now to unify the dates of Easter, promising us that if this is done, He will do the rest to unify us completely and bring peace to the world. The wars, he says in a message, the terrorism, the natural catastrophes like the tsunami, all is because the church is divided. He said it in several times. The Lord says in a message, 
And as for unifying the dates of Easter, I'm still at their doors waiting, as a beggar waiting for their alms. I'm still waiting for them to unify those dates. In unifying the dates of Easter, you will alleviate my pain, brother, and you will rejoice in me and I in you. And I will have the sight of many restored. That reminds us of scriptures when Jesus said, remain in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will remain in my love. If not, the Lord says, anyone who does not remain in me is thrown away like a branch and withers. These branches are collected and thrown on the fire and are burned. Obviously, many have not taken seriously these words of Christ. How false and corrupt could one be? Despite the Gospels calling us to remain united, Despite the promptings of the Spirit, our division remains. Therefore, true life in God must not allow any more this gangrene that kills the function of the body to overpower all of us. But we must fight it with bonds of love. We should all feel responsible for having allowed this disease to devastate the mystical body of Christ, even if it did not come directly from us, but came from our ancestors, swallowing the unity of the church. There's also something important to say, and that is the church too should always give way in humility and listen to the cries of all of us, the laity, that have the right to express themselves as well, who are desperately seeking unity and intercommunion. Without us, the laity, there is no church. We, lay people, all want unity eagerly, don't we? Since we all know that God abhors division, it's contrary to God, because it is wrong and a scandal. So my question is, why is it that some people of the church knowingly keep offending Christ by insisting in keeping this division alive? To live unity with love and humility is not a question of sentimentality, nor is it trading the faith and the truth, but it is to declare from the scriptures the truth and put alive every word of the gospel. We should not remain dead to the word of God, the Christians that remain divided are not living this truth. No matter how credible and righteous and glorious they want to appear in the world's eyes, and no matter how many Hail Marys they will be saying daily, still they are not credible in the world's eyes. Their lack of love and their lack of humility, which is so obvious, are a giveaway sign, which we all notice. It's now been centuries that the Christians are divided. Some admitting their sin and some admitting mournfully that they have no power to share the Holy Eucharist together. 
So what's holding the church back? What holds them back is the fact that they cannot agree, nor reconcile, nor forgive, because again, love is missing. So long as their hearts are not kindled with love for Christ and with the fire of the Holy Spirit, they will remain inactive and inert, just as the dry bones of Ezekiel's vision. Also, if the church is not yet living in full communion, it is because everything that is expressed or discussed or explained, it is done without love. It's sterile. This division is directed against Christ. All who call themselves Christians and abide divided have broken the commandment of Jesus Christ who said, love one another. Let's face it, the Christians who do not love and have only lived in self-glory will never reconcile because they have not yet grown fully into Christ. Remember when Christ in the Last Supper said the blessing and raised the bread telling his disciples, take it and eat it. This is my body. Then he took a cup and when he had given thanks, he handed it to them and said, drink from this, all of you. For this is my blood, the blood of the covenant, poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. This is Christ's commandment. And so we must, all of us, try to obey it. How can we say we live in Christ if we have not made peace or reconciled with one another? Has it ever occurred to the people of the church that they are living daily the sin of their division? Therefore, if this is known to us, the shepherds and all of us have to choose. There are two choices here. The first choice belongs to God and comes from God. And that is to live in love, peace, humility, reconciliation, and unity. The second choice belongs to Satan and comes from him, and that is hatred, war, pride, lack of forgiveness, ego, and division. It's not so difficult to choose, but then, when we choose and take part on God's side and not act on it, we will be held accountable. And we will all pay for every arrogant attitude, every pride, every prejudice, for our grudge, for the lack of charity, for our coldness, and for every word we uttered against one another, we will pay for our ego, and so on. Because we would be breaking Christ's commandments. It's as simple as that. In Judgment Day, we cannot tell God that He has not shown in our times His mercy and that he has not shared his designs. Nor could we pretend we have not heard him in his calling. He calls us left and right in many signs. Nor we can say that we have not understood him in scriptures. I know as well as you that the signs of the times 
are calling us all for the unity. So how is it that some of the authorities of the church are unable to read the signs of the times? We cannot dismiss those signs. They are so obvious. We cannot dismiss those signs coming from the Holy Spirit. And yet some do. Because they've lost the sense of the supernatural and believe only in naturalism. And that is a grave sin. These, I would say, sterile actions go against what Christ asked the Father in his prayer when he said, May they be one in us as you are in me and I am in you so that the world may believe it was you who sent me. And even more when we do nothing about it, to bring unity in the church and remain silent, like sepulchers in a vast graveyard. If anyone tells you that you are doing the wrong thing, when you are living a spiritual unity or having intercommunion like today and in these last days we've had we shared it together if anyone tells you you are wrong you should ask these people why do you put God to the test by imposing on the shepherds to remain divided if you are questioning me about my act of reconciliation and love, you must know that I am only following the commandment of Christ. So what is best to do? Follow the commandment of Jesus Christ or disobey it? Is it a sin to love and reconcile with one another? No, obviously it is not. Sin is rather the transgression and the rejection of the commandment of our Lord and the calling of unity. Your sin has destroyed part of the church and made a desolation out of it. And you know it. How can then the body of Christ be recognizable in us if we remain divided? How could the world believe that it was the Father who sent Christ? I have chosen not to be like those tombs who are as inanimate matter that is dispersed and torn asunder by their ego and by their spirit of pride and prejudice and self-interests. But I will listen to our Lord and I will remain in him and live the gospel. For I have read with the help of the Holy Spirit the signs of the times which call us for unity, sharing one cup and one bread around one altar. I want to be the perfect icon of unity, graciously drawing everyone to live a true life in God and thus abide in the Holy Trinity. And you will see, my friends, when these words will be uttered by you, the reaction of those who hold the keys to the kingdom of God and do not enter and neither let others enter. Their reaction will be identical to those of the then rulers, elders and scribes, Annas, the high priest, Caiaphas, Jonathan, Alexander and all the members of the high priestly families who had persecuted Peter and John who said to each other, 
to stop the whole thing spreading any further among the people, let us threaten them against ever speaking to anyone in the name of Christ again. Today, our response to these should also be the same one as Peter's and John, who said, you must judge whether in God's eyes it is right to listen to you and not God. We cannot promise to stop proclaiming what we have seen and heard. And where, in another situation, Peter and his apostles said to the Sanhedrin, the high priest, obedience to God comes before the obedience to men. Ask these people also, who of us two is sinning? The one who has reconciled with his brothers, sharing one cup and one bread and following Christ's commandments, or the one who has not reconciled and keeps this division alive, spitting venom on his brother and thus siding up with the divider who is Satan? Is Christ a God of division or of unity? I, for my part, believe I'm on the right side because I have chosen reconciliation, this one that the gospel is preaching us. I am not convinced that I'm sinning or disobeying or harming the mystical body of Christ or declaring harmful morals to the faithful. On the contrary, I am reconciled with my brothers in humility and love. Living the spiritual unity our Lord has been pleading us now for centuries. This is what you should tell them. The Lord said in a message, Raise your voice in my house and ask my shepherds, is there anyone willing to work with vigor and love to rebuild this tottering house? Is there anyone in there who is willing to defend this house? Is there anyone who understands now what I'm saying? Is there anyone in the Lord's house who is disposed to expand the kingdom of God? Let us ask our Lord to send His Holy Spirit who is the source of Christian unity to continue and to forgive those who remain divided and who are sitting like obstacles on the way to unity. Let us ask our Lord as well to strengthen us all so that we never get discouraged or wear out if any vile act is done upon us by those who do not listen to the Holy Spirit's calling to be one. Christ has said in a message, I could utter only one word in their assemblies and with that single word unite my church he has that power we all know it but the glory of heaven will be given to me by poverty wretchedness and by those they call contemptible so here I take with all the true life in God readers and people the position of poverty, wretchedness, and looked upon the learned and the wise as contemptible. And I'm asking the officials of the church to stop their quarrels between themselves for the sake of Christ's love and their insincerity and their indifference towards unity and permit the Holy Spirit to guide them and listen to the groanings of the Spirit that asks 
commands us to unite around one altar, sharing one cup and one bread, and together proclaiming in one voice that there is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, and one God who is Father of all, over all, through all, and within all. Thank you very much.